Welcome to Becoming Boss C. Today's lesson focuses on Domain 2, Independence and Objectivity of the Certified Internal Auditor Exam, Part 1. These are the syllabus requirements for the second domain of the CIA exam, Part 1, and the related cognitive learning level. A and B are tested at the basic level, and C and D are tested at the proficient level which means the Institute of Internal Auditors expects you to have a more detailed and thorough knowledge of C and D. Today, we will discuss independence, which relates to A and B. A, interpret organizational independence of the internal audit activity. And B, identify whether the internal audit activity has any impairments to its independence. Let's start discussing independence. What is it? Independence can be defined as freedom from conditions that threaten the ability to complete internal audit responsibilities in an unbiased manner. Think of independence as lack of interference from a person or a group that does not inhibit audit performance. In other words, the auditor can conduct all audit procedures during planning, field work, and reporting without influence from parties outside of the internal audit function, such as the chief executive officer, chief financial officer, senior management, or a third party. So audit procedures can be performed without pressure or coercion from anyone outside of the internal audit department. The internal audit activity should be performed independently without influence or threats from management. The internal audit department should act as an independent function that is impartial, unbiased, and not excessively influenced by senior management and functional management in daily operations. The audit committee should be confident that internal audit activities are performed as intended and effectively assess governance, risk management, and control processes. As we mentioned in domain one, the chief audit executive or the internal audit director reports functionally to the audit committee and reports administratively to senior management and the chief executive officer. So while the CEO may learn about the internal audit department's budget, only the board of directors and specifically the audit committee has insight about how the chief audit executive will be hired only the audit committee knows details about the audit, audit plans, results of audits, significant audit findings, and high priority audit recommendations. What are the elements or types of independence? Well, there are two. There is independence of mind and independence in appearance. Think of independence of mind as the mentality or state of mind that allows an internal audit to be performed without any negative influence and limiting influences that may compromise internal auditors' professional judgment. When an auditor thinks independently and performs audits with an independent mentality, they act with integrity and exercise the required level of professional skepticism. You may have heard of professional skepticism before. It simply means that auditors do not solely rely on the words of management. Instead, they ask probing questions and also obtain sufficient evidence to support their final opinions and conclusions. The second element of independence is independence in appearance. To understand this concept, Think about if the CEO's son is the chief audit executive for the same organization. Do you think a third party or the public would think the organization's internal audit activities appear to be completed without the CEO's influence? Probably not. Or what if the CEO and the chief audit executive both lead a separate business together and have known each other for 20 years? Do you think a person outside of the organization would think the chief audit executive manages the internal audit function independently and without interference or direction from the CEO? Probably not. So independence in appearance is the absence of circumstances that would cause a reasonable and informed third party to conclude that integrity, 
professional skepticism, and objectivity within an auditor, chief audit executive, or audit department has been compromised. In summary, it's vital that internal auditors are independent of mind and independent in in appearance. So reasonable third parties can view them as impartial, unbiased, and fair. Let's briefly discuss ethical behaviors. Internal auditors are expected to perform audit procedures by upholding ethical principles, such as integrity, objectivity, resource utilization, and professional behavior. Internal auditors display integrity by performing their work with an attitude that is facts-based and objective. In other words, they perform their work with the same standards regardless of who the control owner is, regardless of which management group they are working with, etc. In our personal lives, we think of integrity as acting the same way regardless if no one is watching or if everyone is watching. The next ethical principle is objectivity. Internal audit procedures should be performed without influence from others and without special treatment or bias. We will cover objectivity in detail in the next lesson. Third is resource utilization. Handle sensitive information and confidential information for the organization's benefit and not for personal gain or personal benefit. So, if you work in the finance department and you see that the company is about to file for bankruptcy, it would be unethical to release that information to the press or media in advance of the company's official announcement. It would also be unethical to share that news with outsiders such as your family. The last ethical principle is professional behavior. This means that auditors complete assignments in accordance with the organization's policies and in alignment with the internal audit charter and in accordance with relevant technical and professional standards, such as the IIA's professional standards. So now that you know what independence means, it is time to discuss threats to independence and factors supporting independence. Threats to independence are circumstances that make it difficult or inhibit internal auditors from applying independence to their day-to-day audit activities. Threats can affect the entire internal audit department or a specific engagement team or an individual internal auditor. The self-interest threat is the threat that a financial interest or some other interest will inappropriately influence the auditor's professional judgment or behavior. For example, If a manager receives a bonus for not having any issues identified in the audit report, he or she could unethically give the internal auditors a percentage of that bonus. Therefore, internal auditors could be persuaded to overlook issues within that manager's department just to receive a financial benefit. The next type of threat is bias threat. This is the threat that an internal auditor will take a position or stance that is not objective based on some form of political, ideological, religious conviction or belief. For example, an internal auditor who cares about the environment and the earth may make conclusions that dissuade management from pursuing a drilling or mining project. If the internal auditor forms a conclusion only based on their conviction to save or preserve the earth, that would not be objective and it aligns with his or her personal standards about earth conservation. Another type of threat is the familiarity threat. This is the threat that close associations, long-term relationships, or family relationships will lead an internal auditor to take a stance or position that is not objective. This can result in nepotism, such as promoting an employee simply due to favoritism or close association. The next threat is undue influence, which arises when internal auditors are influenced or pressured by outsiders, third parties, or members of management and This affects the auditor's ability to be independent. 
For example, if an internal auditor receives a warning that their career or their future at the organization could be negatively impacted if they act a certain way, or if they come up with a specific conclusion or, or opinion about an audit, this could be an undue influence threat. When you think of undue influence, you can also think of organizational politics. Exchanging favors in the workplace, forcing coalitions or alliances at work, and seeking sponsors within the organization are all forms of office politics and organizational politics. These can be viewed as positive or negative forms of organizational politics. Management participation threat is the threat that results from an auditor taking on a role of management and performing management's responsibilities and duties on behalf of the audit client. If an auditor implements a new control or tells a department to do something that is not related to the audit, this is management participation threat. Remember, we can consult with our clients and provide suggestions or audit recommendations, but we should not manage other departments or implement new activities in our audit clients' departments. Structural threat is the threat that an internal audit department's placement or hierarchy level within an organization will affect the internal audit department's ability to perform work objectively. So, if the internal audit function is auditing its own work, this is a structural threat. If the internal audit department is not structured as its own separate function within the organization, for example, if it reports directly to human resources, this could impact or influence the results and work related to human resource audits. Previous employment threat, which is also known as the self-review threat, is the threat that a current internal auditor who previously worked in a non-audit department that is being audited today will not appropriately evaluate the results of previous work performed in that non-audit department. For example, if an internal auditor who recently transferred from the supply chain department is now assigned as an internal auditor auditing their own supply chain work, this is a structural threat. As you can see from the various threats mentioned, there are multiple factors that could cause an internal auditor to not perform audit activities with an independent mentality. Now, let's see what circumstances can support independence. Regularly conducting training over ethical practices as an internal auditor supports independence and teaches incoming and existing auditors to always act with independence when performing work and to be unbiased and have a healthy level of professional skepticism. Having a segregation of duties between the internal audit function and other business functions also supports independence. So internal auditors do not take on the role of managers in other business functions or departments. Having auditors sign a conflict of interest statement also supports independence. This way, the statement informs internal auditors about what a conflict of interest situation is and auditors can report if they have any known conflicts, such as having a relative who works in a key position within the organization. Granting internal auditors unfettered and unlimited access to records, information, and documents also supports independence. Personally identifiable information, such as employees' social security numbers and personal addresses, may be removed from files. However, other data should be readily available for internal auditors. There are plenty other circumstances that support independence. Can you think of any? If so, comment a few below in the comment section. I will quickly mention others. The chief audit executive can promote auditors' professionalism through continuing education requirements and encouraging auditors to obtain certifications. Requiring all audit committee members to be independent of the company is important. Establishing a formal audit charter that guides internal auditors' work and standards is vital as well. If you are still here, be sure to subscribe to the channel for more important information. Also, 
go ahead and click the like button if you are enjoying this lesson. Next, we will answer some practice questions. You can pause the video in between questions if you need more time to contemplate the answer. Number one, when internal audit work is performed based on facts and evidence, this exhibits which of the following ethical principles? A, objectivity, B, resource utilization, C, integrity, or D, professional behavior? Objectivity is incorrect. Objectivity is based on performing credible audit work that is fair and neutral. Resource utilization is also incorrect. It deals with handling sensitive and confidential information responsibly. Professional behavior deals with abiding by professional standards when performing audit work. This is also incorrect. The answer is C, integrity. And the answer is C because remember we said that integrity was acting the same way you would when no one's around or when everyone's around. So not letting opinions and biases affect or influence the ultimate decisions, but determining conclusions based on facts and evidence obtained. Number two, organizational politics is a part of which of the following threats to independence of the internal audit organization and to an individual internal auditor? A, bias threat. B, management participation threat. C, familiarity threat. D, undue influence threat. The bias threat is where the internal auditor performs work and makes audit conclusions based on their personal convictions, beliefs, and ideologies. That is incorrect. The management participation threat is where internal auditors take on the role of management. That is not correct. The familiarity threat is where audit work and conclusions may be influenced based on the internal auditor's personal relationships, long-standing long or long-term relationships, and close associations. The answer is D, undue influence threat. Organizational politics is a challenge in maintaining independence due to its undue influence. Extreme organizational politics can slowly lead an organization's processes, and culture to failure by demotivating employees and negatively changing the organization's culture. Number three, which of the following is not compromised when an internal auditor has compromised his or her independence of mind? A, objectivity, B, integrity, C, continuing education, or D, professional skepticism. Remember, when an internal auditor has independence of mind, they have a mentality that is free from influence or persuasion from outside parties. And those who are not in the internal audit department cannot influence their decision. When an internal auditor is not independent, they cannot perform audits objectively and with integrity. They cannot also display a healthy level of professional skepticism by asking probing questions and factoring those answers into their final conclusion or opinion. So the answer is C, continuing education. This is because continuing education or training is not compromised when independence of mind is compromised, while the others are. Number four, which of the following actions would be a violation of auditor independence? A, Continuing on an audit assignment at a division for which the auditor will soon be responsible as a result of a promotion. B, reducing the audit scope due to budget restrictions. C, reviewing a purchasing agent's contract drafts prior to their execution. Or D, participating on a special committee which recommends standards for control of a new general ledger system. Reducing the audit scope due to a low budget is not a violation of independence. This is actually a common decision made by the chief audit executive or audit leadership. So B is incorrect. As part of due diligence, internal auditors may be tasked with reviewing contracts prior to their execution. This is actually a great procedure to perform. So the organization is not signing bad contracts with unfavorable terms. So C is incorrect because that is not a violation of independence. Recommending standards or control activities is an internal audit responsibility in order to add value to the organization. So this is not a violation of independence. 
The answer is A. Remember, we talked about the self-review threats or employment threats. If the auditor will soon lead a division they are auditing currently, these circumstances could impair independence and the auditor may not perform audit procedures with integrity and without bias. Number five, which of the following circumstances threatens independence? A, managers coerced internal auditors to issue a clean opinion with no issues identified. B, the chief audit executive provides professional training for internal auditors. C, the internal audit department receives a copy of the internal audit charter upon hire. D, management provides internal auditor with access to relevant evidence and documents. The answer is A. Management should not coerce or persuade internal auditors to write a specific conclusion or opinion. Instead, internal auditors should perform audits and determine conclusions and opinions based on those known facts and evidence obtained throughout the project. All other options, such as continuing professional education, training, and receiving the internal audit charter, or having unfettered access to management's documents, support independence. Wow, there was a lot to explore in this lesson. If you enjoyed the lesson, subscribe to the channel to receive notifications about new videos and like the video as well. If you made it this far, comment independence in the comment section. That will show me that you watched until the end. Type independence below in the comment section. There are other ways to support the channel. Look in the description box below. Also, I have an announcement. I will try to go live on YouTube at least one Sunday a month. So watch out for those scheduled live streams on YouTube. As always, stay blessed and stay boss C.